down the hammer and pick up the pencil. You're about to listen to the Savvy Radio Show. Learn from real life real estate investors. Experience revealed with the Savvy Landlord. Oh, that, my voice host. cracked there, Chad. <laughs> That's how you start the podcast with a cracky to crack voice. Anyway, I'm excited to be back into the studio. Mm-hmm. I have one of my, oh, uh, you already know, if you have not listened to the last podcast, you are missing out. This is full-blown entrepreneur, gets you to the next level. But before we get started, hey, it's important that you subscribe uh, to the podcast, um, hit that button, log in, or go to SavvyInvestors.com and get on our mailing list, and we can just uh, keep you informed because we have a lot of great things going on. Uh, Last episode uh, was completely... uh, incredible for me personally, because I feel like I I was out of the closet. But ultimately, I was able to introduce you guys to Chad Misseldine. And if you know, we're going to get deeper into Chad Misseldine, um, his gifting as a coach, and also he's going to kind of break it down on how to be an entrepreneur. And I'm truly excited about that. And uh, in this episode, I want you to, I want to give you guys kind of like the high points of what we're going to try to get accomplished today. And then we're going to wrap it up and kind of have a summary. But, you know, the main gist of today, obviously, in the next several uh, episodes is entrepreneur. But how do you know if you are an entrepreneur? I think it's so critical of whatever you do in society and life, you should ask really good questions. And that question is, how do you really know? I, I know that we chatted last time about operator versus entrepreneur. And it's it's that just that title is raging in me about people think that they're an entrepreneur, but they're really just a good operator. And we're going to, we're going to break it down on risks. The, the overall arching theme today is taking risks, risks and how to take risks and how to uh, uh, identify risks. Risks are totally different in my mind than maybe even Chad's mind or your mind and the power of knowing others, you know, your network is your network or your net worth is your network, you know? And, um, uh, you know, maybe a couple of surprises in there. So let's just get started. Welcome to the Savvy Radio Show. Chad Misseldon, how you doing? I'm doing great, Stephen. And, and for those of you who are listening, you can't see this right now, but Stephen, he's a good dresser. He looks sharp. <laughs> I'm staring right at him. He's sharp. And there's mountain bikes all around me. So you should know that. This, this dude loves the mountain bike. And uh, I feel like I'm in the presence of uh, greatness right now. <laughs> I don't feel greatness on the on the trail. <laughs> but uh, if, if I could uh, uh, act like one, uh, you know, my, my son, all the bougie people got uh, on cloud shoes. Is that what you wear? No, I don't. No, <laughs> I'm, so no. I, I I wear mountain bike shoes incognito. They they're dressed <laughs> up, and I and I'm always from from child that I always like to wear something that no one else has. I don't know if it's pride or weirdness, but I always try to introduce something. I guess it's my California culture. But my my son picks up on it. You know, he's into on cloud or he's into UGG boots or or Nike or Jordan or whatever. But I'm I'm, I'm rocking the uh, five ten Adidas mountain bike shoes. There you go. That's it. All right, Chad, uh, I appreciate that compliment. And, uh, you know, I don't, I don't have one for you. So. Thanks, man. <laughs> it's a compliment just that I'm here. You're, yeah. you're hanging out with me. That's a compliment enough. Uh, the only compliment I have is that you inspire me when I watch you on Facebook uh, running and you inspire me on how social media skills you have with Instagram. I don't and, know about um, that. But that's the only two things that pop in my mind. But, hey, let's just get down to dirty and get down to business. Let's do it. And so, Chad, you know, what is it? What does entrepreneurial mean to you? Yeah, so I think I think what I thought that meant early on growing up was like you just work hard, right? Mm. So that was a big thing in my family. Get out there and get to work, you know? So for me, it was when I was, in, you know, in college, coming out of college, it meant just going out and working hard. And that's what I did, man. I worked in the oil field through college. I'd wait tables. I mean, started doing just I, th- I thought it just was this idea of like the harder you work, the better you are at business, but I was completely missing it. Um, we all know there's a difference in being a hard worker and being smart at it. Right. Yeah. I think that that's the misconception and I'm just going to smash that real fast. I think hard work is ignorance. I think that leverage is all things and you have to, if you're not really good at raising money, you got to tap into someone else to raise money. If you're not really good at writing a business plan, then find someone else to help you write a business plan. And I think that 
working hard, could you could be working hard in the wrong direction. Absolutely. In the oil field, has that helped your career now as a superstar coach? I mean, I think it showed me I needed to stay in school. <laughs> Damn, you know? no, it did it. Uh, it did it. Working at the oil field, did, what, what skills did you acquire from working in the oil field? I mean, we would work 80, 90 hour weeks. What skill? And uh, communication. <laughs> I had to learn it. You know, okay. guys were getting their fingers blown off by dynamite. I worked with dynamite. <laughs> I know. That's what I'm saying. So what I'm like, skill? I don't want to do this. And it was motivation for me to get out there and actually switch over, which is what I want to talk about. The motivation. It was motivation. Uh, you know, hard worker puts in long grinding hours. And I think of that mindset is like addition, right? Like okay. the harder I work, the more I work. Um, that's an employee or as you call it, an operator mindset. The challenge with that is you can't, you can get ahead in life, but at the end of the day, you're still trading time for money, right? Mm. And you're still only adding the value of your labor, your trade. Um, you know, that's like the people that argue like, hey, minimum wage should be more. Well, I, I'm all for people getting paid more, but at the end of the day, you know, there's a lot of people that can do that type of labor, right? So the, the, the mm. value of it is only you know, what the market sets, but, um, hold on, let's get back to the minimum wage. Yeah. I think uh, Jim Rohn really talked about minimum wage is, is what you bring value to this world. That's right. You only get what you give. And so if you're, you know, I love his stories. Like, Hey, you work at McDonald's, you might get 15 bucks an hour, but if you whistle while you work, which brings value, meaning uplifting people, you might get $16 an sure. hour. I think as an entrepreneur, you really needed to dive in. What value are you bringing to the marketplace? The bigger the value or the more impact, the more return that That's you will right. receive. Yeah. And the book E-Myth that you probably have read a dozen times, uh, uh, Michael Gerber says value is what people perceive it to be and nothing more. So am I bringing that value? So for me, that it was getting out of that employee mindset that I grew up in that was limited, it's dependable, it's safe. And again, that's okay. It's okay to be an employee, like for yeah. some of us, right? There's nothing wrong with it. And I've been all kinds of different yeah. employees. We need employees. And we and s some people if you're great working a job and that's not you like don't hear me knocking people that but if you want to be an entrepreneur you have to realize it is a different mindset an employee adds their own time and energy in return for paycheck or payment but an entrepreneur leverages the time and energy of people right and so the employee is doing addition the entrepreneur is doing multiplication they're multiplying mm -hmm. through others resources through through problems so it's a different mindset so that's to me, it, so it took me, I guess my point is like when I knew I was an entrepreneur, it took me a while to figure out, okay, wait a minute, I don't want to be an entrepreneur, I don't want to be an employee, I want to be an entrepreneur. So mm. it, it took me kind of stepping out in faith and, and like trying some things out um, to, to learn that about myself. You know, I think it's a really good point that you brought up the word employee, you know, as I own a, in the accounting firm and there's employees that I have, right? I'm, I'm responsible for them. But one thing I think that we could elaborate on is intra- Entrepreneur. There, there's a gal in my organization that I think is an entrepreneur. She's been around entrepreneurs her whole life, and she's an intra entrepreneur. She's giving us ideas and stuff, and she's just accepted the fact that I don't want to do that. Take that risk. Sure. So I guess the difference is from employee is lack of risk. In my, you know, in my mind, I think it's all the risk because you're giving your life to this employer, and one day they could let you go. One day the economy could change. And I think why I love being an entrepreneur is that you are in control of your destiny. Yeah. So, I mean, so you just said one day the economy can let go. So, so quick story. Uh, it's 2002. I'm like in graduate school. I was trying to, I was trying to date my current wife and I'm like trying <laughs> Current. To, your yeah. only wife. But, settled down. But my pro, yeah. My, my only see. wife I ever had to be real clear. <laughs> current life. It's uh, like you're like trading out. Yeah. So, <laughs> so I'm, so I'm in school, but like I didn't have any money and I was, I was, I was borrowing more and more money to be in school. And so, so it's September 11th happens and you guys remember what happens in our country, right? Um, World Trade Center, boom, get hit. And, and so the economy well, hold on. freezes. Yeah. Where were you at? At I was, I was in, I was in graduate school in Abilene, Texas. And so everything stopped for you. In yeah. Texas. Yeah. Every, well, I, I was putting off the inevitable of going to work and I, I wanted to, I was, I was still trying to figure out what, what I want to be when I grow up. Right. Um, but I was in grad school. So, but I was up at, I was up to my eyeballs in debt right. and I met with one of my mentors and he was like, you need to move, man, Chad, if you want to get married to this girl, you need to move to Dallas, Fort Worth, which is nearby. And he's like, you need to go get a job. So that's what I did. I moved, I moved to Dallas, Fort Worth. I was sleeping. I didn't even have a place to live. I was sleeping on my buddy's couch hmm. and I'm looking for a job. I was wanting, I was stuck in that employee mindset, like, right? I'm like, I'm looking for a job, which is what you do after you invest, you know, $150,000 in college. So I'm in debt up to my balls. I'm looking for a job and 
The, but the problem was right after September 11th, for those of you that are old enough to remember that, like the job market froze. Nobody was hiring. Wall Street was, mm. you know, frozen. Everything. Everything was frozen. So here I had all these great experiences. I had like banks. I'd done people's taxes in college. Like I'd hustled, man. Uh, but nobody would hire me. So I would put on a suit and go out and do all this. And um, so I, I'm so de- what'd you I'm land literally, on? What'd you well, I'm literally desperate and I'm going, okay. So you just get up. I, I, get, every day my go- buddies would go to work. And I would get up and like not have a job. And eventually I'm like, all right, I could, there's something I could go do. What can I do? And I think that's important because some people, you know, you get stuck and, and man, you just get, you overthink things. And it's, it's, it's important. Just like at some point you've got to just get into momentum and do something. So I, it's really random, Stephen. I had this experience where I, I worked in inner city church with these kids. And, and I remembered in this old church, there was these church pews in this guy's barn in this is for, uh, Fortress Church in, in Fort Worth. And I remembered from the summer before he had these church pews. And I just, the, I don't know if it was prayer or like desperation or, or God provided. Maybe. Um, <laughs> but I was like, I wonder if that dude still got those church pews. Those would make cool benches for people. So I called him up. His name was Jeff. And I said, Hey, you know, you probably don't remember me. You know, I brought a bunch of kids in. We worked at your church. And I remembered you had these old pink church pews and you told me they were filling up your storage and you need to get rid of them. And I'm just curious, do you still have those? And he was like, yeah, actually I do. And I'm like, you know, I'm trying to hustle or whatever and be cool. And I'm like, Hey, I'll, do you, you know, I'll come take those off your hands for you and haul them away. And I won't even charge you anything. And he kind of laughed and he was like, I tell you what, uh, I'll sell them to you. And I'm going, Oh my gosh, I don't have, I mean, I had some savings in a bank account, but I'm like, I don't have any money. Interesting. So I'm like, what do you want for me? He's like a thousand bucks. So I went and I had a savings account from working in the oil field and it had like a thousand and twenty six dollars in it. Dude, I wrote, I went down and wrote that dude a check for a thousand dollars on the spot that day. Okay. Hold on. You, 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 you proposition the guy for free and then yeah, as an entrepreneur, you didn't negotiate here. You just dropped a thousand dollar check on this dude. So here's the deal, man. There was 40 of them. How old were you at this time? I was 22. Okay. <laughs> I wanted to get married. I was desperate. And I, and so it, what was your, what was so, your end goal here? Okay. So there was you four, do? so there's 40, 10 foot church pews. And I'm like, man, that would make 40 benches. benches. You cut, they were 10 foot long. And you were going to cut these. Yeah. I didn't have so any tools. the vision. I didn't have any tools though. I didn't have any tools. So, I didn't even, I, I had a truck, but I didn't have anywhere to put them. So I knew this buddy of mine and he let me use his barn and I started going out there and chopping these church pews in half. I would take one end off the other and I would, I went and bought like, I, I had, stripped li- them, yeah, I had to paint them. Yeah. Strip. And I would restain them and I took them to a flea market and I would sell them for 500 bucks a piece. <laughs> And you did? Yeah. So my mom had this flea market. She was running out of stuff uh, to sell. So and I was like, "Hey, mom, did you? How much did you make? I made, I don't know, maybe ten grand out of that thousand. Wow. And I bought a ring for my wife, so I got out of bum status, <laughs> <laughs> made a down payment on an apartment, and that was what kind of fueled your entrepreneurial. Fueled, yeah. And and, and th- you know, then I ran out of the the. I, then I had all these five foot sections, and I like. And then I didn't have any in, so I started going to builders, um, dumpsters. I was dumpster diving, dude. I had I had no place to live. And I was dumpster diving, and I would ask them for lumber and get their permission, and then I would make like ends to them, and I started making other stuff. So, wow. I think you know when I think back on it, you know, at the time there was like a lot of restraint around my life, but that's what actually sometimes leads to innovation um, in our lives, yeah. and, and and that's how I knew. I was on well, the risk. Yeah. I just knew I was on the only thousand dollars in your bank. I mean, it, it's interesting that you, this story is awesome because it relates to a story that I have. That's ex- extremely similar. But the thing is, mine did not turn out as successful as yours. I, you, you look at your, I can just see a 22 years old. You look at your bank account, you have a thousand twenty six dollars and you take this giant risk of liquidating your whole thing that you took forever to build. I mean, how many yeah, hours every, of labor? Everything. Yeah. And then you took this risk and then you put in man hours, physical labor to create these benches. And then the ROI is just off the charts. So there's a similar situation I had. I, my, yeah, dream, my dream was to be in a, 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 to own a club. And you know, Cheevers over there, yeah. over next to... Uh, Love some uh, Cheevers. Yeah. Well, next there is the body piercing and there's this little gas station right there. Okay. And so, um, this is, this is, this story for you as an entrepreneur, don't do this. (laughs) Right. I have some of those too, by the way, (laughs) if you want to hear them. But it it was close to a thousand dollars. And I think the rent was $975. 
And I was going to, this is the first time I was, I was involved with music and DJing and, and sound. And a guy came up to me, an investor said, Hey, let's open a club together. I'll provide all the sound and lights. You do this sales and marketing. I mean, this is a match made in heaven in my mind. So I found that location, that old gas station. I signed the lease. My only $1,200 to my name no was nine seventy five, and the $300 deposit or something. I signed the lease. I give, give this gal my $1,200. And this is like 15, 20 years ago. And I call the investor. Similar scenario. That's all I had in the bank. I'm going to be rich. I got this. I call the investor. And, you know, he's been harping me for months. Yeah, let's do a club together. You know, duh, duh, duh. he drives down there. He walks inside the venue and says no. And the listen, and I lost $1,200 oh that day. Gosh. And I, I don't remember. I think I pawned a few things to pay for my rent at that moment. But what I learned that day as an entrepreneur, so you see how Chad, he went out there and did it that way. I went out there and I learned the most valuable lesson to this date. And I will never do this again. I always raise the funds before I pull the trigger. And I think that's risk too. Sure. And see, the guy was like, I want to do it. I, you know, I believe in you. Okay. But then I pulled the trigger before I raised the funds. And now when, when someone wants to do a deal or open a club or whatever the case may be at this time in my career, 25 years later, okay, great. Show me where the money is and let's do it yes. together. I'll put up my $600. You put up your $600 and let's go lease the club together. And I think there, there's two principles here. One, there's both risk. Your risk turned out 10,000, a hundred fold. Fantastic. My $1,200 similar price point cost me a college education. And it took me about three years and I was very frustrated, but I was like, man, that was the cheapest education. And now all the deals, I, all the time I, I coach entrepreneurs and they're constantly in that position where I trusted someone, I was going to do this and it failed. And now they're out completely of being an entrepreneur. Right. But you learned so I much learned from that. that. Like from, is, that from that failure, yeah. in my mind, I was burned, but you know, it's my fault because I should have got that dude on a contract. Sure. I should have, okay, sir, what, tell me what's your budget sir what's the detail see and this is what's so great about you chad is like you know this podcast today guys you may love this podcast it's super organized because of chad misseldine he has notes it's organized and he has a and see i think those are the skills that you have to acquire to be successful you, you have to find an individual or learn a skill like being creative it's maybe natural for you but if you don't have the detail mindset, you're going to fail. And that's what happened there. I believed and trust him because of my vision. And the guy believed and trusted my vision, but I didn't have the details. And I learned so much. And I, and I, and I use, that was my very first real lesson because it caused so much pain in my life. And I have no idea what, how long it took to recover from that. But it was well worth, uh, and I think that's the difference. People ask me all the time, how'd you get on tour? How'd you buy all those houses? And it's like, I just did it. And I think that's the reality that we need to, to convey today is being an entrepreneur is like, just do it. He, Chad took the, the balls to call a pastor and try to get him for free. But then he also was committed to his dream of being successful, of getting married and going to the next level and getting a ring or whatever. And, and, and he, his drive made it happen. And then he put the money on the table and he had to perform. And I think that's true entrepreneur right there, Chad. Yeah. Well, I love your story and um, I love how, you know, I, I could share with your listeners here like dozens of uh, stories similar to yours where I did something stupid, right? But the key <laughs> is that you learn from it, right? And that you took the risk. And I think there's, I think there's smart risk and dumb risk, right? Mm. Like I, I hear people all the time smart. that are like, you know, I'm going to quit my job and go do this deal, right? Or And they have no track record or they, maybe they're, they have a family to support, and they're, they're, you know, there's a lot, there's, there's, there's a lot on the line for that individual to, I would rather see them in certain s scenarios, like, man, let's get you an on-ramp for that first. Mm. Um, so, so I, th I think it's different if you're young and 22, like I was and you got nothing to lose. Right. So and, I think there's smart and knowing the difference between the, the smart risk and the dumb risk can actually, that's I real wisdom. That. I think. I love that. And I think that two things there you said that were very powerful. I think one thing I would have is connect people to the right people. Like, you know, if someone's done this before, you know, maybe shadow, but I think a lot of people has this analysis paralysis Yes, that they, they, they plan too much and then they don't pull the trigger. Absolutely. And I think that's where we really need to kind of assist you today. I know that, you know, I, I posted on Facebook the other day, it was something that I was reading. It's time for you to level up. 
and I think uh, one of our listeners out there today, it's it's time for you to pull the trigger. It is. And, and even if it's a, like, I love what you said. It's smart risk, dumb risk. Five hundred dollars is a dumb risk to me. Ten thousand dollars might be a dumb risk for you. It might be a hundred thousand. I mean, but go take the risk. Yeah. At the end of the day, you've got. You're only going to know if you do something mm-hmm. right. You, and, and I think that's. There's so many people that I talk to, Stephen, over the years. They're like, man, I'm thinking about this, or I'm doing this, or my company's thinking about this, and they don't ever do anything. Mm-hmm. And I, I swear, I had coffee with a guy recently, and he was telling me an idea he had, and I, I'm pretty sure. We had the same exact conversation like five years mm. ago. He's still talking about it. Right. And again, I'm not judging him. Sure. I'm just saying if we want to move forward in life, you have to be willing to take some some bigger risk. Um, if you want big rewards, if you want small rewards, take small. You know, don't take any risk or take small risk. If you want big rewards, take big risk. Mm. And then you can start to like once you get your feet on the ground a little bit and start hitting some base hits, then you can start. Building, on building that. onto it. That, like, that's what I do with the church pews. It's a silly story, and I don't ever want to touch another church pew in my life. But, like, I went to Hobby Lobby. Once I started selling them, I went to Hobby Lobby and talked to a manager. And you know how they have, like, the half-off sale yeah. at Hobby Lobby? I'm like, hey, dude, can I take your inventory and try to go sell it at this flea market that I go to? And he was like, uh, what? And I was like, yeah, I'm just going to take it. I'm gonna, I'm gonna, it. Yeah, I'm going to leave the price tags on there, and I'm just going to go sell it, and I'll bring back what I don't sell. Did he, and, did he do uh, it? And he said, as long as they're not damaged. So I started taking, so then I got so Hobby no Lobby cost business. in it. No, no cost. So I would go out there and I, I would That's leave awesome. the full price tag on it from mm-hmm. Hobby Lobby. And, you know, I bought it for half off. Right. And then, then, but I was already making money with the church pews. And then I started adding to the profit margin mm-hmm. by selling all this other stuff, you know, and, that, but it started with one step. And then, you know, the, the, like the Hobby Lobby deal was zero risk. I could take it all back. Yeah. And so uh, I, I just love the, the the transitioning, you know, from pews to Hobby Lobby to the flea market. Uh, reveal one more. What was the next one from there? Okay. Um, and I, I just love the steps, man. I mean, it's it's honestly I, I think of it as a pyramid, and I don't know if I've ever showed you my pyramid, um, how how cash flow and how I look at the pyramid. But, you know, what was your next thing after that? I mean, you got confidence in building. Now you know how to repair things because I'm not mechanical. So you have that mindset. Then you got then you got the balls to talk to a manager, which is like rejection or you're a fool. And then you got he, he released the product to you. You had no risk, really, but your time and energy. So then what happened from there? Yeah. So I, that's how I got into real estate. I mean, I, I was building this, this guy's barn and maybe, maybe if you have me back for another episode. I'll tell the full story, but I was building this guy's barn and he was like, dude, you know how to see things and see what they could be. Right. Mm. And he's like, you have, you know, decent common sense. You can work with your hands. I never worked with my hands a day in my life. I didn't even know I could do that until I tried it. Right. On the pews. No, I never even done wow. that stuff. What, did, um, what does your dad do? Or what uh, did he, he do? sells life insurance and investments. <laughs> like he's a financial advisor. He he White he collar. barely he barely struggles to change the oil in his car. You know when we used to do that on <laughs> our own. Awesome. But my grandfather had that. He he could build stuff. So I got, I guess I got that from him. But um, but so I started looking into opportunities. You know, in, cool, in, in right? that and that's how I got in real estate. But um, I don't know, man. I mean, I, I I just think there's probably somebody listening to this today. You know, and you've got this like you've got this unique gift that's inside of you and you've just been waiting for permission to go out and use it and change, change somebody's life with it. And so like maybe today, this is your permission slip. You're, you know, Steve and I are giving you permission Mm -hmm. to go out and do whatever that is. It might be furniture. It might be real estate. It might be starting a, you know, a restaurant. It might be opening a bank. I don't know. Um, But you don't have to, you don't have to wait, you know? So Chad, what, what would you say to an, and someone that has stuck in the employee mindset? Like, what would you, what, what, you know, if someone called you one of your clients that relatively new and they're like, man, I, I don't want to be employee or they're stuck in that mindset. What, what would you say to them? I, I would probably do, we do leadership intensives all the time. I would probably, I would probably try to get with them for a couple hours, do what we call leadership intensive. And I would dig into what they really want in their life because you know, it's one thing to hear on a podcast and you guys, if you're listening to this podcast, you probably listen to other, it's one thing to hear what, what other people want, but what do you really want mm, in your life? Come on. What do you want in your life? Do it's you, you know, do that. you want, and some people, they want security and they want, 
um, to be safe. And that's great. Like I've, I've done that with a good part of my life is to live and have a job and, you know, insurance and mm. 401k and all those stuff. Um, but what do you really want? What's important to you? What do you value? Why do you get up and, you know, and, and, and go in the morning? What drives you? And I would dig like deep into that um, and yeah, because I'm, there might be gold in there. And, you know, and sometimes you just need help getting well, that drawn out. What, first of all, what you're saying is, and guys, we're just, it sounds so flippant and so simple. But two things I, I really need to hammer home. He said gold inside of you. But here's the thing. When you finally determine what you want, it's a life change because now you have a directory. Now you kind of have an understanding of what you should be doing. And all the decisions that you're making every moment should lead into what you want. And, and, and for whatever reason. And I think you know, maybe it's because I'm middle aged now and I, I think this way. But when I'm in front of someone and they're having a conflict with their staff or their business and I'm trying to help them and analyze them. The first question always pops in my mind is, what do you want out of this? Yeah. Well, I wanted this and make this. Okay, I want to make you know $500,000 a year. I'm, is it po- Absolutely, it's possible. But are you willing to put the work in? Well, if you want to be, if you want just to play video games all day. Yes. It's not, you're not going to achieve the 500,000 because you're going to have to learn how to have better social skills or better leadership skills, or you're going to have to learn how to fundraise. You're going to have to learn these skill sets that you're going to have to be committed and take a certain amount of time to acquire those skills. And, and you and, know that, but your driver, the why has yes, to pull you. It has to. And, and if, if you've done that exercise before, I would challenge you guys listening to ask like dig a little deeper, ask a question behind the questions. Okay. So I want, what do you want? Well, I want to, you know, have financial freedom. Okay. Why, why do you want to have financial what does it look freedom? Like? Yeah. Well, like spell that out, dream a little bit. And so that I can be, you know, take my kids to school or coach my kids soccer practice at three 30 instead of being at work. There you go. And, and like to get the question behind the question and you'll on, on, if you can get to like some of those like heart passion, you know, wise, um, th- then, then you can find that gold inside of, you know, and you it know, sounds cheesy, but no one exercise I give them. What, what would you do if you, it was the perfect day? I know that sounds cheesy. If you had a magic wand, I love Brian Tracy he used to say this all the time. I mean, what, what would your day look like? I, yeah. I know you as an athlete, I'd get up and go work out, then maybe go read, maybe go swim. You know, what does it look like? And how do you achieve that? Right? You might have to get a passive assets that produce, or you love to work and you you're on your feet 60 hours a week, and you love to open a restaurant, but you feel like you can't, you don't have the money. I mean, that's always the biggest excuse. I don't have the money. Oh, that That's Anyway, but you know, maybe one exercise is what would be the ideal day for you? Yeah. What, what would it look good. like? What, what time, where, how, what would you be driving? Where would you be going? What would you, what neighborhood would you be living in? And these are key indicators of where you're at. And, and so you can set legitimate goals. If you're, if you want to live in a specific neighborhood or a two story house or a 3000 square foot house, you, you need to write that down. And, and if you can't articulate it, have help some help you get it. But if you don't write this down and put it on paper, you're never going to accomplish it or achieve it. Yeah. And, and some, for some of you, it might mean volunteering somewhere. Mm-hmm. That was for me. Like all I wanted to do during when I was during that season, I really wanted to work with high school and middle school kids, mm-hmm. but that, that type of, and I will maybe share that with you Good. in the future, but it, you know, it doesn't have to be something that you get paid to do. Right. You could love to go work, you know, mentoring students or helping people learn to read or, right. you know, hanging out with elementary kids and making them a safe place. So, um, yeah, man, could be yeah. anything. No, I, I, I'm, I'm glad, you know, listen, ladies and gents, uh, this was not my podcast. So, uh, Mr. Mr. <laughs> Mr. 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 Dine here, he, uh, uh, put this together and he has a passion to educate you and me on being a true entrepreneur. And so we hope that, you know, give us some feedback, go to savvyinvestors.com or go to chadmissildine.com. There's a link in the description and give us some feedback. You know, did you like this podcast? Uh, was it impactful for you? Was there aha moment in there? Uh, did we miss something? Is there something that we can uh, articulate on even more? But, you know, Chad, I would love for you to sum up, you know, your last thoughts and let's uh, wrap this up today. Yeah, I mean, 
just the, just the fact that if you're listening to this podcast that shows you want something more in your life, mm. d- dive deep into that. If it's taking a risk, great, man, go take some, don't, don't make a life shattering risk that you lose everything. Like take a smart risk, but take it today. Quit talking about it, do it. And know there's other people that have gone before you. You're not alone in your journey. You're not out on the island. You've got people around you. Search, search and find those people to support you and get it, get a good motivator behind you. Get really understand what's your, what's your driver, what's your why. And, um, man, take, jump out and take the, take the next step. Love it. Live that life. Be an entrepreneur. Thanks for listening to the Savvy Radio Show. Glide online and listen to our other motivating episodes at SavvyRadioShow.com. Connect on Twitter at LandlordBook and always be buying assets. 